Hey everyone, this is Mo Islam back with another episode of Pathfinder presented by Payload, the leading digital media company in the space industry. Our guest today joins us with one of the most storied backgrounds in space, employee number one and former propulsion CTO at SpaceX, founder and CEO of Impulse Space and race car enthusiast. I'm quite obviously talking about none other than Tom Mueller. Tom and I talk Impulse, his company that's building maneuvering vehicles to help payloads move to higher energy orbits around Earth and beyond, his time at SpaceX, cars, and a lot more. But before we jump in, a quick word from our sponsors. Spider Oak's Orbit Secure software is designed for hybrid space operators struggling to manage the chaos of securing data flow and access to and from tens of thousands of small satellites in low Earth orbit. Using a unique combination of end-to-end zero-trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, Orbit Secure allows your mission to orchestrate and secure Earth-to-orbit, Orbit-to-Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure hybrid space environments. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero-trust security and resiliency to your zero-gravity environments, check out SpiderOak at www.spideroak.com. Tom, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Mo. Great to be here. Uh, Well, I will say being able to chat with not just a rocket scientist, but the rocket scientist is pretty (laughs) special. So I'm I'm pretty excited. Um, So uh, I want to get right into it because getting I know getting on your calendar is not easy. Um, At SpaceX, you led the development of the Merlin 1A, uh, the Kestrel engine for Falcon 1, which, uh, of course, was SpaceX's first um, liquid field rocket. Um, you also oversaw the development of a variety of different Merlin engines um, and variations of Merlin engines for the Falcon 9. Right. You were involved in the Draco th- thrusters, the Super Draco engines, the launch yep. escape system for Crew Dragon. And you also began the developmental work for uh, the Raptor engine, which now obviously powers Starship. So yep. I feel like my first question should be, um, what is it that you didn't help uh, build at SpaceX? Um, but I think a better place to start is you, really how you got into working in propulsion and what really drove your passion for wanting to work with rockets. Sure. Well, I was always, you know, as a kid growing up in Idaho, son of a logger, I was always mechanically inclined. And I think just being around logging trucks and, and motorcycles and stuff, I was always like into basically in heat engines, you know, of any type. I have a steam engine that I got for like my 12th. Uh, for t- when I was 12 years old for Christmas, I still have it. Um, and I, you know, I started flying the little Estes rockets when I was a kid, I, I think before fifth grade, because we did it uh, as a fifth grade math class, we were flying them and I was already flying. I remember I was, I was already had some at that time. So before fifth grade, I was flying uh, the little model rockets and I was always interested in rockets, but it wasn't, I think until I got into college and learned, you know, fluid dynamics and and really the engineering hardcore classes i really started to think that liquid rockets was was so cool and and ever since college really i knew i wanted to be a a liquid rocket development engineer and so i basically followed that path so uh before spacex i know you spent some time at a company called trw yes so maybe tell us a little bit about you know the work that you did there um and yeah i moved i moved to california in 85 even though i had some job offers up in the pacific northwest non-rocket i i I rejected them and moved to california to work on rockets but i actually ended up taking i actually had a a, i actually had in 1985 uh an offer from rocketdyne to work on water flow of the of the space shuttle uh pumps uh, the SSME pumps, but it was a really a low ball offer. So I took a higher <laughs> offer at Hughes Aircraft working on spacecraft. And I was, I was only there a couple of years, still wanting to work rockets. And I heard up that TRW, which was just, you know, a, a couple miles away, right. um, did rocket engines. So I said, I got my resume in over at TRW and I got an interview and, and I got in over there in, in 1987. And immediately started, like, I think I've told this story before, like one of the first things I worked on, it was part of the um, the, the Reagan uh, Star Wars thing that uh, uh, was the SDI right. back then. Um, and it was, uh, the, the oxidizer was chlorine trifluoride with hydrazine as a fuel. So you had this, this oxidizer, it's basically like hypergolic with everything, with concrete, with, you know, with, with uh, any material with detonates with water, right. uh, hypergolic with test engineers. You know, it was it was crazy propellant. So one of the first things I worked with was like one of the craziest oxidizers out there. 
And then everything else while I was there, it was all it, actually in the early days, it was all spacecraft stuff. I was doing like Draco type engines. Right. And in fact, that's why the Draco engine ended up like of all the engines I designed for um, for SpaceX, the Draco ch- changed the least. It looks exactly like I drew it up because I kind of knew how to, really knew how to do that engine. The only thing that really changed on it was just like the little holes in the in the panel on the, the final injection orifices that we developed that, that, we, that we tuned as we ran the engine. But I don't think we ever changed the body uh, or the, the combustion chamber or anything on it. it. Just it worked because we did a lot of those when I was at TRW. The Merlin changed completely from the first you know, sketch to to the final to, to the first one we tested, and then to, to first, certainly to the final version. Uh, so, but, yeah. well, so, so, so that that's interesting. So, so it kind of leads into you know you spent time at TRW building you know obviously large scale rocket engines, and um, I think it was the. TRW 106, yeah, the, which was the first, the first, like I would say eight years from, from 87 to, you know, the early nineties or mid nineties, I was working on the spacecraft stuff. Then, then I got involved with the, the 40 K LOX RP engine. I, I, I led that development. And then uh, I got on the 650 K, uh, which was basically the in competition with the RS 68 for the Delta four. Um, and we got thrown off the pro as soon as Boeing had already bought uh, uh, Rocketdyne and then was buying McDonnell Douglas. The first thing they did is threw us off the program, which I think was a mistake. I think we had actually a, a, a way better uh, value proposition with our engine. But anyway, we, we, we did get a chance to run that engine in, in like 2000 with uh, at, Na- at NASA Stennis. So it actually and actually engine ran really good. And that was part of the that was part of the space launch initiative, I think it was called. Yeah. At the time. Got it. Okay. And then, uh, so, and th- that engine ultimately either w- was discontinued or, or, or yeah. scrapped. We, okay. We, yeah. We got, we got some money from NASA to go run it. And everybody said, and that was, a, that was the only booster size engine ever run on, on liquid, uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen at the injection point, everything else, every other engine vaporizes the, you know, the, the fuel, the, uh, the hydrogen, and then you get the, the, the liquid gas mixing and, and better combustion stability. So everybody said this engine is going to be way unstable because all the data they had said if, if you don't have that, that density ratio, it's going to be unstable, and it ran smooth as could be because the pedal engine is just so inherently stable. Uh, we we can we can have it a, a whole episode just talking about your time at TRW, and yes. we're gonna come, we're gonna come back to spa- we're gonna come back to SpaceX as well. But I do want to talk about what you're doing now, which is very exciting. Um, and you're going uh, just to kind of tie in, you know, large scale rocket engines to now, you know, Drake more like Draco like thrusters. And I you know, would love to hear a little bit about yeah. impulse. And we're gonna um, do some bigger stuff. We're starting we're starting with Draco size, you know, with the the our what we call our Rigel, our 180 pounder was the first. An engine that I that I designed. It's actually that one right up there on the shelf up there. Um, it was the first engine that I designed um, after I left uh, SpaceX in in 2020, and that's our basically four of those are going to be used on the the Mars lander that we're doing with relativity. But we also have this little uh, this little five pounder here that we're flying eight of these. Uh, this is a safe. Uh, thruster that we're flying eight of these on our um, on our Mira spacecraft. It's going up on Transporter Nine here in October. But after after I left SpaceX, I knew that the next really the next market was going to be in space. Like I, I kind of see it, like SpaceX is a stepping stone to where the real action is, which is in space. I mean, the whole idea of launch is to get into space. And with you know with um, with Starship coming online and being able to take a hundred tons to Leo every time it flies. It's like there's going to be a huge opportunity to move things around in space. Did you, um, when you left SpaceX, that was in 2020? Uh, that was late 20. Yeah. I think it was about November, November of 2020. Did you, in the middle did, of COVID, <laughs> did you already know what you were going to do or were you really. taking I a knew, breather? I was going to take a breather. I, I was, I, I, I I wanted to develop this little engine. I want to get back to my roots of spacecraft type stuff. And I knew that I, I really thought that the, that the nitrous ethane would, was probably like the right place to go with, with really like low cost being the, the target now. I mean, if, if you, if you, if you can get there so cheaply with uh, with a starship flight, why would you spend a whole bunch of money on a, on a, you know, like 10 times as much, 
money on a like a storable like a hypergol system to get you know five percent more performance it just didn't make sense right. so it, we need a new paradigm and and the, really the problem that people had with these propellants is like oh it's not hypergolic you got to light it it's like uh how reliable is that well how reliable is your car lighting each cylinder hundreds of times a second you know it's like it's not if you do it right it's, it's very doable and i think we've proven that so it really opens up just like a completely non-toxic propellant now like that we can just run right here in the shop it's it's no more dangerous than like your like your methane like natural gas in your stove really right you know nitrous you can breathe ethane you can breathe other than being flammable it's you know or and a high a rel- relatively moderate pressure liquid it's it's pretty um pretty benign compared to like hydrogen and nitrogen tetroxide you know which are dead, deadly poisonous right so 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 you go from so you spend well, 18 years if my count is correct um at spacex um you know solving huge 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 problems um and you know you leave you decide to take a breather and uh i want to get back to what you said earlier you, this is the next huge problem that i think you want to solve can you get, can you help under help me understand sort of what is how big is the market for what impulse is ultimately going to do and what does your initial product set look like what does that initial sort of um customer base look like and you know how big just give me a sense of scale right so let's maybe start there uh, i mean it's it's the the market is gigantic and nobody knows what the market's really going to be you know 10 years from now when starships flying when the moon economy is really developing with you know the, the you know the china threat how much how much defense is moving to space it's i i think i think the predictions are under really right now it, it's a gigantic market but we want to be we basically want to be the prime mover for in space if you have something you want to move around in space we want to be the the reliable high efficiency guys that to provide that so within um within earth orbit and beyond it's definitely beyond like we like you know fully reusable space or fully reusable launch vehicles like starship are very efficient at getting to leo um but they're not efficient at going to high to higher energy high energy orbits without like refueling because right. you have to carry the you know the heat shield and landing propellant and, and a lot of extra stru- landing structure in order to to make that upper stage reusable so there's there i think there's a good market for uh, an, a high energy stage that goes that that's coupled with starship to to go to to geo or to lunar orbits or even beyond and that's that's our helios pro- product helios okay so um you said mira is the is the first product that you're working on that's the that's the uh mira is a storable you know like like a hypergol so it can it can you know it could stay on orbit for years it can you know like our mars vehicle is a, is a mirror product is you know it's a it uses those propellants because they're storables it has moderate performance good enough for for leo um good enough for for hanging out like say in, in geo but to get from say from leo to geo where you got to do you know over four kilometers per second of delta v that's where you need something like uh you know like like a methane and oxygen or you know a very high energy propellant and that's what that's what helios is going to be ultimately yes. i see mm-hmm. okay so it's interesting okay so so this makes me think are, are you kind of taking almost the same playbook at impulse as you you saw at kind of spacex with the falcon one the mira is sort of like smaller than what will ultimately be the core part of impulse's yes. business so mira is kind of like it's it's an addressable market because you know it's, it, it, we can do these ride shares and last mile uh delivery which is a very addressable market and then that you know that that thing can evolve into bigger versions of it where we can you know put more more propulsion on we could do a a, a larger version of mira, of mira with bigger tanks and and the, the rigel engine you know the, the 180 pounder if we want to have a bigger prime mover right um and then but but unlike falcon one where you know like like falcon nine replaced that product line these two are complementary like say that you want to you want to go up and and loiter in geo and move and move around in geo so you use helios to get there from leo and then and then you have a mira as you're basically as either to host payloads up there or, or to, to um, deliver payloads to to there i see i see so um uh let's just talk about um 
Helios for a second. So it sounds so it sounds like almost like it's a kick stage to 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 Geo for for so for satellites from 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 Leo. Um, that feels like a bigger, much bigger market than what Mira is going after. If I'm yes, if, okay. So then, um, and, and just using some like numbers that I've just kind of Googled, um, I'm kind of curious, like just to un- sort of understand the economics, right? So, and, and tell me if I'm thinking about this right the way, right way. Falcon Heavy um, cost per kilogram to Geo, and I'm sure this is like a very optimized number here, but is around call it five thousand to six thousand dollars a kilogram. Um, and to Leo, it's around maybe you know, $2,500 to $3,000 a kilogram, depending on who you ask. So help me understand, like, if I, so if I'm a satellite operator and I need to, eat, need to get to geo right now, why is it better for me to use, for example, you know, a launcher to take me to Leo and then use Helios to ultimately get to like a GTO or geo orbit um, versus going maybe direct with like a Falcon Heavy to geo GTO? Is that, is the cost savings very evidently clear? Yeah, well... Well, a, a Falcon Heavy to, to Geo, like that Viasat 3 that just flew a few weeks ago. That right, the expendable, to, expendable one, I think, is the one you're referring to. That was fully expendable, right. They yep. had to throw away that whole that, that whole thing, which is, I don't know how much that costs, but like a regular Heavy is like $90 million, So we're talking over $100 million to put six tons in, in, into Geo. Um, so say we go up. We go up on Starship. Even if we bought the whole Starship, which we wouldn't need to because we would, we would just be like a, a ride share on a Starship. But even if we bought the whole Starship for, I don't know what they are, $60 million, and, uh, and then we could sell that stage for maybe 20 So now for half you know, or for like $80 million. But certainly if we, if we just um, ride share for $20 million, now for $40 million, we can put four or five tons in, in right. the, it parked in GEO, no, no GTO, no, no huge propulsion system required on the spacecraft. I see. I see. Um, you, uh, okay. So I, I want to talk, I want to go back to the, what, the thrusters that you were talking about. So the small, the small thruster, what, what's the, um, have you uh, talked about the performance of that publicly? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was just, it was just qualified, um, about two ninety seconds of ISP. Um, it can, we did over 6,000 pulses. I think we did almost 7,000 pulses on one and over 7,000 seconds. And didn't break it, so we don't know what the limit it is, the cycle life or the the time limit on it. But that's just what we needed for for Mira. So, you, and you qualified that in seventeen days. Yep. So, what is the? Uh, well, that's why that's why I read online. That's what I should say. Um, yeah. What What is the? So, uh, talk maybe talk a little bit about uh, about the significance of that, like how the team was able to um, achieve well, that. So we quickly. did it. We did a pretty ex, uh, extensive development program with it. I mean, the thing is, we had the test stand right there in our in our shop, you know, like basically 50 feet from our engineers. We could just run. It. And the nice thing about it, you're running in vacuum, so it's quiet. You don't even hear the rocket engine running. You just hear the valves clicking. Um, so other than the, 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 you can hear the pump running out, out, out back in the driveway. You, know, you can hear the, the vacuum pump running, but it's pretty quiet. So completely non-toxic propellants i mean there's there's some safety but it's nothing like running a hypergol like you couldn't run a hypergol here in the city like you'd have to go out somewhere you know in fact you, we went to texas to run hypergols at you know at, at uh, spacex so um just having it can run it all day long engineers are right there they can go back to, to their desk look at their data and we uh, we got pretty lucky on the design you know i designed this thing and it basically worked right from the get-go it, it, it was igniting right from the start, it, we had uh, we made a couple changes on some hand some machined hardware to get to where we wanted. Then the first one that we printed were working great. So right. it's just a little bit of massaging things to get the performance up and the temperatures down. And the, the awesome thing about it is, it's like it's it's get it runs on gas, so it's it's actually running on gaseous um, nitrous and and gaseous eth- ethane. So you're actually not cooling with liquid, you're cooling with the gas. So the cooling is not great. So the, the metal actually runs pretty hot. I've never seen a region that runs red hot before. So we're running over 1,000 degrees F where it's cooled. But that keeps that keeps the material down to where it still has strength. Like the perfect spot to run you know, this in-canal alloy is, is around 1,200 F, which is where we're running. And then on the uncooled part of the skirt, where there's no stress, but it's running at almost 2000 degrees F, which is the oxidation limit of the material. We don't need the strength. We need the oxidation resistance. So it actually worked out just right. So we're running basically the, 
the maximum temperatures you would want to run it for long life, long duration, and therefore extracting maximum performance out of the engine. It's running you know, like better than 95% combustion efficiency. So we're getting everything we can out of these propellants. And it, it worked out great. And it was easy to qualify, actually. When, when is the uh, first mission? Uh, we're going on Transporter 9 here in October. So we've got a spacecraft being fi- in final assembly out there right now. And that's uh, that's flying out of Vandenberg? Yes. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Which awesome. would be great because we can have our investors go and all of our employees can go up. It's a lot easier than having to go all the way to the Cape. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about the competitive landscape um, because orbital transfer vehicles, space tugs, there's a few out there for sure. Now, yeah. um, you know, we can we can certainly talk about your team and I think it it's, speaks for itself. And I, I, I know many people in the industry would, would certainly vouch for that statement. But I'm kind of curious, like, how do you think about the existing uh, number of companies out there that are l- looking to solve similar issues and problems? Um, and maybe let's let's start there at a high level and maybe talk about, you know, is the market theoretically large enough for a, a whole host of these types of companies that, um, that, doing this? That market is crowded and, and very competitive. And I don't think it's where we ultimately really want to be. Um, we, uh, what we did was we maximized the amount of impulse you can put in a lower transporter spot. So we can, we can definitely carry a lot more payload with the same Delta Delta V as anybody else. So we have more capability down there, which means we can charge more, but it, there's fewer rides that need that kind of capability. And we found those rides that need that, but we also, because we've been able to raise more mo- more money, I think with our um, with our seed round and our Series A we're doing right now, can can go develop, you know, s- bigger technologies like Helios, and you know we're we're going after it like we'd love to do lunar. Um, we we we've, we've got a Mars contract, so we're going after the harder stuff that other people wouldn't necessarily take on or would take a lot longer to, to ramp up to. We're ramping pretty fast to do the harder stuff. Why, uh, why was chemical, I'll ask a fairly basic question. Why was chemical propulsion the right place to start and maybe not electric propulsion, which I know some other folks are, are working on. I'm an expert at chemical. I, you know, I, I, I've just dabbled in electric. I did, I did spec the system for Starlink and, and helped hire the people that led that, but I'm, I'm definitely not an EP person. I think eventually we'll probably add EP to our repertoire because it definitely has a place. But I, we want to be a prime mover, and I think moving fast. People people are in a hurry, and to get to you know to get from Leo to to Geo, you got to you got to go through the radiation belts, and you want to get through there fast. So chemical makes a lot of sense as the our primary locomotion, and then having I think have an EP later for like like just sustaining you know where where you're at for a long time uh, makes sense are there any uh learnings with regards to kind of spacex's approach um to kind of end-to-end vertical integration that you're adopting at absolutely vertical integration is where it's at yeah yeah um what are sort of some of the um i'll ask a sort of broader question what are sort of some of the elements and about the process of innovation at SpaceX that you're kind of carrying over to your work at Impulse? Well, yeah, you just mentioned vertical integration is, I think, super important to, to control, you know, cost, schedule, and quality and reliability. So just if you want to have complete control of those, you've got to be vertically integrated. So that's that's one. Just like hire the best, hire the smartest people, keep them happy, give them the hardest problems to solve. And you know what? I think like a lot of people don't realize, um, like the, I, I've been asked a lot of times, like what was this, the secret sauce at SpaceX? And number one is just the people, right? From Elon on down, just he, he was good at recognizing and, and attracting talent. And and we were all, I think, good, built good departments that had really smart people. But we also, because, you know, they were the, SpaceX was the first company that I know of that, that basically did the whole launch vehicle and owned the whole thing. Every other launch vehicle is built from, oh, we bought an engine, engine from these guys. We bought structure from these guys. You know, typically the structure guy would be the integrator, bought the engines, bought the avionics, bought the fairing. And it was it was just done by spec very slowly, a lot of lawyers involved. And as, as the design evolved, it was even if things were wrong, it just got built that way. So they were never they were never optimized 
we optimized everything about like the the size of the engines, the staging ratio, the um, even the mixture ratio. Like you know, run fuel rich at lift off, maximum thrust, and go more ox rich later in the burn to get maximum ISP. Just things like that that other people weren't even thinking about doing. We would do. Um, so I just remember like when we first were getting ready to fly Falcon Nine, you know, about twelve years ago. Uh, so, you know, some article coming out and in the comments, you know, some old space guy is going, there's no way that little rocket can, can do like what a, what an Atlas can do or what a, you know, a Delta four can do. There's, there's no way, look how small that thing is. Cause it was, it was just so compact, so much thrust, uh, so well integrated, such a great thrust, thrust to weight on the engines and very light structure. So it just, it, it, it. It, because it was all integrated as one piece and everything was optimized, it, it's, it's remarkable how much the Falcon 9 can do. And then it ended up becoming the most reliable rocket in history. So we, we definitely did something right there. Yeah, I was actually I was at the Cape uh, just on Sunday watching the uh, launch to the ISS on AX2, which was pretty exciting because... Yeah. Um, they sent uh, a couple Saudi astronauts and, yeah. and included the first female Saudi astronaut to go to the ISS. Anyways, yeah. it was all very, very much really awesome exciting. mission. Very and they cool were able mission. to opti- further optimize to where they were able to return to launch site for the landing. So yeah, pretty, that, I yeah. think that was the first time they did that. Right back to the uh, back the, to the pad on on with a man capsule. Cape. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So pretty pretty cool that now they can they can launch crew and and come back and land on land. Yeah. All right. Let's talk. Let's talk about the relativity mission because I know that was a that that, that created a little bit of a splash. Um, so that the, the the plan there is 2026. You're heading to Mars, Terran R. Um, yeah. You're building a cruise vehicle, entry capsule, and a lander. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, maybe let's that mission. Um, it. You you have a date, you know. You have to launch at twenty six, and if you miss that window, you're probably stuck for another couple of years, right? So, talk about sort of the development timeline, how you're thinking about between now where we are today to 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 launch. Well, we were actually trying to get to the twenty four launch date, which was really a stretch. Um, it was more of a stretch even for for Terran R. So ultimately, that moved off to twenty six, which I think most of us felt was, was going to happen ultimately. But now it feels more doable. Um, and I've stressed this before. We're not we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. This this is basically copying you know Phoenix and Insight you know size capsule shape uh, using heat shields that have been developed using the same parachutes using the same mortar. Um, the really the the innovation is the lander. The lander is is different than what they what has been done before. You know using the Rigel engines and and, and that's a completely new design. But um, everything else we're just trying to to use what has, has has successfully landed many times by NASA on Mars. So like to try and go back and and redesign that EDL, I think would be foolish for a, for a small company. So we definitely want to do what was successful and then innovate on, on the product that gets there. What, um, what compelled you to work with relativity specifically? They, you know, uh, Good friends with them, know a lot of people. They have a lot of SpaceX people that, that I know. And you know, they wanted to do something pretty audacious with one of their early missions of Terran R. So they came uh, over and sat down with me and said, hey, we want to do this uh, first launch of Terran R. We want to do some crazy mission to, to, to Mars. And would you would you do the spacecraft? And, you know, we, 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 we were just months old as far as we just incorporated. And it's like, this is what we need is some clip a really cool mission to get everybody excited so yeah yeah, yeah let's do it so um th- there's a there's a quote um that i have of you here um where you talk about and this is talking a little bit about sort of the market where you where you say it's 20 times um more efficient to get material and propellant from the moon than it yes. is to get it from the surface of the earth right and i want to yeah. talk for a second what that means because you know there's i get this question a lot why are we yeah. going back to the moon why are we going on mars how is that a business like what, like, yes, everyone talks about, will SpaceX one day be a trillion dollar business? There's some people say, yeah, but it relies upon interplanetary colonization. And then, you know, you, you dig, people dig the extra, you know, foot or two feet into that type of remark. And you realize that maybe there isn't a lot of, there hasn't been a lot of thought put in behind sort of like what that ultimate market looks like. Right. And I think one right. of the things that really stood out to me 
was um, looking into some of the resources that are present in, for example, even the moon, right? Things like helium-3 that trades at millions of dollars a kilogram here on Earth, right? So I'm kind of curious, like, what was the genesis of that comment that you made? And like, how does impulse like fit into that equation? Well, I think, you know, like manufacturing in space is 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 starting to happen it's it's and i think it could really take off it just makes sense but pretty pretty soon you just it, it, as that market grows you're like man how do we reduce our cost if you're lifting material from the surface of earth and it's literally 20 times more efficient to to bring it from the moon and everything that you need here is on the moon you're going to say let's go develop the you know this this lunar economy and bring it from the moon over because it's just it's just a velocity thing you know it's to escape from the gravity well of earth is 11 kilometers per second to escape from the earth is what is it 2.5 so it's just that ratio squared because uh, energy is velocity squared and that comes out to like 22 so it's it's more than 20 times efficient more efficient to bring it from the moon you know 240,000 miles to lower throw it than to bring it for 200 miles up from from earth it's just Pretty crazy. Uh, so I want to, uh, I want to, um, and I'm sorry, I know I'm bon- bouncing around a bit, but you've, you, you've, you mentioned a few different things that I want to like make sure I get back to. You talk about team, right? And the importance of team and building a team together. So I want to set the stage for you a little bit. Let's rewind the clock about 20 years. Um, Elon convinces you um, to come over to SpaceX. You very confidently tell him that I can build this engine. Um, you and Chris Thompson become employee number one and number two. Um, at SpaceX. And then you realize, um, hey, as much as I have a lot of confidence in myself, it was a lot harder to recruit people than I originally thought. Yeah. Right. And and maybe it was a blessing in disguise, but really the nature of my question is, you know, it it, it in a way forced you to look at non-traditional maybe folks, right? Yep. And what is there is there sort of a lesson there that you can kind of think back and draw upon? And how do you think about team construction and impulse today? Because you're you're in charge now. You're it's all it's all you. I mean, you you built your team yeah. over over at SpaceX for development of Merlin, and now you're doing it all over again. Right. Well, I think you know what we did at SpaceX was we 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 Elon found some you know some people that had industry experience like myself and Chris and, and some others, and they became the leaders. And then we weren't able to hire too many people from industry because everybody thought. You know, oh, it takes a, a country, you know, like like the U.S. government to do this. You can't a private company can't do it, which ended up being great because we were we just went and hired like fresh outs out of school, like really smart kids out of top universities and trained them the right way without really having like this you know negative bias of of, you know, of old space. Because like we were a tech company right from the beginning and I had to learn really what that meant because I came from old space, but I, I think I was a entrepreneur at, at heart. So I got it and it just, you know, it became the SpaceX way and it was, it just, it's the right way. It, it's worked so well. Um, awesome. So, uh, Tom, let's, uh, um, we're, uh, we're at that, we're at a halfway mark. So we're going to take a very quick short break. And then when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about SpaceX launch and, your love for racing, which I know is probably your number, your number one topic. So we'll be, we'll be okay. right back. <laughs> Great. Space is the new frontier for cybersecurity. To quote the commander of the U.S. Space Forces Operations Command, cyber threats are unfortunately the soft underbelly of our global space networks. Spider Oak, the leader in space cybersecurity software, is dedicated to providing space operators the solutions they need to protect hybrid space systems. Their Orbit Secure software uses a unique combination of end-to-end zero-trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, allowing missions to orchestrate and secure Earth-to-orbit, orbit-to-Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure LEO and hybrid space systems. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero-trust security and resiliency to your zero-gravity environments, check out SpiderOak at www.spideroak.com. All right, Tom, uh, welcome back. So I, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, launch and uh, talk a little bit more about just propulsion in general. So uh, it's been about um, 14 years since uh, the Falcon 1 last flew. Um, it's been like 
60 or 70 years since the Soviets launched Sputnik, the first kind of man-made object into space. Yet we rewind the, we, we fast forward to today. There's a lot of launch companies trying to get to space. Um, and there's only one that's doing it regularly at scale. Why is launch so hard? So, I mean, billions of dollars have already been lost and evaporated for other companies trying to do this. Why is launch so hard? It is, it's just really hard. You know, like it's often been said, if, if the earth was slightly bigger and gravity was slightly higher, we wouldn't even be able to escape with, with the chemical propulsion. It's just that difficult. Um, you know, the rocket equation, you know, it's, it's, it's ISP times your mass ratio and getting those maximized is absolutely essential. And so you just, you have to design really lightweight, very high efficiency machinery. And a lot of people fall short on that. And then it has to be super reliable because, because in order to be a minimum weight, everything, you know, everything doesn't have a lot of extra margins. So it's not like, like your car breaks down, you can't just pull over and, 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 and get it fixed. You know, you fall out of the sky. So it's, uh, it, it's just a really tough business. And we had, I mean, we failed three times before we, we finally made orbit. We, we barely survived, but then, What's remarkable is we had a couple failures in, in between because of just stupid things that we did wrong. But really, the design was right. I mean, just like look how reliable the Merlin engine is now, and how reliable that launch vehicle is. It just goes and goes. You know, like I don't even worry about. It. I used to worry about it. Like, oh man, are we ever gonna are we gonna fail? It's just what's gonna break? Now it's just it just goes. It's like it's almost become like like your car. It's so reliable. You just expect it to work. It yeah. Used to be you'd, be you'd be surprised if it made orbit. Now you now you'd be surprised if it didn't. Right. So, I mean, uh, even so, since you since you bring up Falcon 1, right, it, it did fail three times, all for, I, I don't certainly don't want to say silly reasons, but I, I think the first time it was like some type of pneumatic line. Second time, yeah, it was like some... Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going back on that. It, you know, it didn't fail because of a corroded nut. <laughs> it oh, failed you... because... Okay. It, well, I mean, it did, but it yeah. failed because the avionics were terrible. Like, we hooked the stages together and we blew the power distribution box and we sat on that island for six months in blowing salt fog waiting for them to fix the avionics and then it's a, we did we did static fire everything worked and then except we had some some diodes on some valves blow so we had to get back in and remove that that same nut again to get get back in there to fix those valves before before launch and that's when that that nut cracked so yes we had a corrosion problem and yes we maybe should have had stainless nuts instead of instead of uh, aluminum nuts but really the 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 problem was that 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 rocket was like six months on a tiny island in the middle pacific just covered with salt fog in the in the worst environment like no no hardware can survive that very long so it's kind of really like an avionics problem that that became a, a propulsion problem <laughs> how, how did you and your and your team um like after flight the failure of flight three how did you and your team bounce back from that? Like, what are like like flight three was really the worst because I mean, we had it. We flight two made it to you know to stage seven, almost made orbit. I mean, that you know we we made five minutes out of the seven minute burn of the second stage. It was like there, and then we had a new better engine, uh, you know, on on flight three. So it's like, oh, this is going well. No, because of that new engine and because of a timing problem, we didn't make it. So that one that just really hurt. It's just like man, just stupidest little thing caused that failure and luckily we had another rocket basically built so we could just you know six six weeks later we had another kick at the can otherwise we wouldn't be here and to be a different world we'd be if, if spacex wasn't here we, we'd be begging putin right now to get to our space station so thank god we made it <laughs> that's right that's exactly right um how do you see the future of um propulsion and rocket propulsion evolving and uh you know is there uh, you mentioned ep um you know we haven't talked about nuclear at all um are, nuclear. Are, are, are there other types of propulsion that maybe you want to spend some time on in the future or you really do think is going to drive the industry forward I, I don't think there's a like chemical. There's not a lot to go. Raptor has kind of maximized everything you can get out of that. And it's the right propellants. I mean, I did that study that we, we were like Raptor was originally hydrogen and we moved off of hydrogen because if you're optimizing for cost, hydrogen is not the right answer. Uh, methane is where it's at. Everybody went to methane for the same reason. So with an engine like Raptor getting 99% combustion efficiency at 
you know, at 350 bar, you just can't get any more out of chemical. That's the, it's just not worth going any higher than that. So the next step definitely will be nuclear, nuclear thermal. And some people are working on that. And, but it's, it's, it's not as big a step as people think. It's maybe 50% better, like, you know, maybe twice as good, but it's not like, it's not a warp drive, right? So I think, I think to really like we're going to need the AI to help us to get to that next level beyond, you know, beyond just heating hydrogen, either chemically or, or nuclear. <laughs> um, how do you so so um, just talking about Starship for a second. So um, Raptor, you were uh, very instrumental in the Raptor development, right? I think we're at Raptor. T- we're at Raptor 2 now, um, you know. I know SpaceX is going to plan to launch that thing hopefully in the next couple months pending yeah. some regulatory regulatory approvals. Uh, how, how, how does Starship play into Impulse's future? And one of oh, the things man. that it's, one of the things that's why that, we're here. One of the things that I don't actually hear enough people talking about is what like yes, everyone talk the easy things easy thing that everyone talks about is um, you know st- the cost, right? What will, what will Starship do to the cost? And there's a variety of different predictions on, on what yeah. that is. I think it, the timeline, I think, is the one that's unclear. But yes. what about um, like engineering and you know, mass constraints and design constraints? Like what will Starship do for that and for how companies across the space industry engineer? And how are you thinking about that as you're kind of building impulse? I mean, that's like we talked about this. Like that's why I picked these propellants, because ultimately it's going to get it down possibly to single digit dollars per kilogram, you know, if they really, really uh, hit, hit all the marks, like if it just becomes the cost of propellant and operational cost and that engine can, I mean, that vehicle can, can fly hundreds of times without major refurbishment, the cost can get very low. And now access to space is, is so much easier than it is now. There's, there's just lots of things that people would do that you wouldn't even think about now. It's, it's kind of like the, the internet in the like in the late 90s people didn't know what the, what it was going to do until all these killer apps came out so i think there's just a lot of of things that are that are, that are going to happen that we can't predict like people say oh it can, it can launch you know everything we need to do on one launch you know so if it costs five million dollars to go launch 100 tons people are going to figure out how to go launch 100 tons of something yeah. certainly certainly opening up um you know commerce on the moon and in, in, in you know the lunar area is, is going to happen are there uh uh what actually let me ask you differently what are and this is a question i do to, i tend to ask every guest which are what are some one or two other companies in the industry outside of yours of course outside of spacex outside of relativity since we just talked about it that maybe you're you're, you're eyeing or you're watching very closely or you're very excited about um in terms of like where they're going where they are now maybe and where they're going rocket lab i mean Kudos to those guys. I mean, on a t- tiny island, I think Ashley Vance or somebody wrote about that. Here's this 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 guy, not even an engineer, on a t- on an island not known for aerospace to develop, you know, the, really the front runner of small launch right now. And I think they'll have a difficult time competing with their current product. But if Neutron does what it's supposed to be and they can make that fully reusable, I think fully reusable is where it's at. So. Uh, is, is where, where everybody needs to be headed towards. So I, I think I think they're definitely going to be a player. And it's going to be hard for I think it's going to be hard for a small launch if they're fully expendable to to compete in the in the long run. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's let's. Um, I want to talk. I'm going to switch. I'm switching gears, and that was a pun. Uh, so <laughs> let's let's talk a little bit about cars because I know how much you love cars. And and last love time cars. I was in your office, uh, half the time that I spoke to you spoke with you was about cars. So I have I have a, I have a uh, I have a scenario for you, and I'm actually really interested in hearing what you have to say about this. So, what would be harder for you to do? Starting from square. So, scenario one: starting from square one, building a formula. Assuming you can you can, you can pick your team, you have the ability to pick your team, but you're leading the engineering, uh, building a Formula One race car from scratch, and you're you have one task, which is you have to win the championship on the first year that that car is on the track. But you yep. get the best driver in the world. So the driver is not the anomaly. It's the car. Right. So that's yep. scenario one. Scenario two is your, you've been tasked. You, everything, every blueprint that you've ever written or read is, is completely wiped. 
you're building a launch vehicle completely from scratch. What would be the harder engineering problem for you? Formula One. Formula One. <laughs> Why is that? Because you have teams that have been working commercially for decades and competing hard against each other for decades and are so good. Like, go try and beat Red Bull or Mercedes right now. Right. On the other hand, Old Space, because just because of the government contracting and just uh, the incentives, it, it, it's no comp- competition. Like we used to say this, we don't, we don't have competition with Boeing and Lockheed Martin. We have competition with basically with their lobbyists in Washington, D.C. It, you know, like you could run circles around them on cost and performance back then, you know, and, and, and really like SpaceX changed the paradigm. Now they brought down their the cost of their launch vehicles by a huge amount and gotten much more efficient, but they weren't back then. So it wasn't even competition. So, and still, I don't think the competition is still at the level that Formula One is. Right. So I think it'd be easier, easier to compete in rocketry than it would in racing. <laughs> <laughs> that's saying that's, and, that's, but, but we're going to get there. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's a great example because now that you have comp, co- uh, commercial companies competing hard, we're going to get there like, like a well-honed Formula One, which SpaceX is almost already there. Are there any uh, principles uh, um, from racing that you've applied to work uh, or vice versa? Um, yeah, I mean, I just like the problem solving, you know, like um, I think I do. I do best at like technical tracks because and I also I always like if you if I go to a track like Big Willow here, which is the closest track to L.A., which is really simple. It's, it's just nine corners. People have been racing that for 20 years. They've gotten every millisecond out of it and if i go there it's harder for me to compete but if we go to a new track like we go to spring mountain with a very technical track that nobody's practiced a lot i usually do better like i, I can learn a track fast and I'm, I'm a i'm a pretty good technical driver i think i just kind of solve it solve it in my head do do the math or something i don't know so uh, it's definitely i love the problem solving part of racing do you spend most of your time like tinkering with the car or racing or racing the car it depends. Like if I, uh, just two weeks ago, I, I had my 66 Lotus Elan out there, which I br- I bring myself. And I, 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 I basically, I didn't even, I, I wasn't able to do practice or qualifying because the car was flooding. So I had to change the jets and fix it. And then I went out in the middle of, you know, at the, at the, started almost dead last because I didn't qualify and turned the third fastest lap and got into the middle of the pack. But um, that, that was definitely a lot of me just working on the car and a lot, very little racing. But most of the time, like if I bring my, my Porsche race cars out, I have a team that does, you know, works on the cars, gasses them up, and I just focus on racing. Do you uh, race with Jim, Jim Contral? Because I know he he's a racer himself. Too. I'm, I have never <laughs> that I know of raced at the same race. I know he's re- racing some of the Vantage stuff and SCCA, but he's he's more east. I'm, I'm west coast, so I haven't yet uh raced against him would be great too he's racing he's racing an old corvette and i'm racing a newer corvette yeah are there uh are there any tracks that you are that are on your wish list that you haven't that you haven't oh, raced on a lot yeah I, I mean even in the u.s i haven't you know if i didn't if i didn't become ceo of this company i'd probably be out there racing right now but like uh like road uh road america um and uh watkins glenn in the u.s but probably my ultimate track that I drive on my simulator all the time would be Spa, Franker Shops in, in Belgium. That's that the ultimate track to me. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the future of uh, racing electric vehicles? Not is very there, exciting. Is there a future? <laughs> <laughs> have I have seen- an electric car. You know, I have that that beautiful green Porsche Taycan, and I've got I've had several Teslas. I still have a Tesla. Um, they're the best for driving. You, know, you have your cup of coffee. They're nice and quiet. They, you just give a little bit of gas and they move. You know, it's, they slip the clutch. They don't pollute. They're the best for driving back and forth to work. You get in the morning, you're tired, you just want to get to work. That's the best way. If you're at a racetrack, you want the noise, you want the engagement of shifting gears. I don't know. It's just, it's not the same. I watched Formula E and I just, I just, I just didn't get the thrill that I do when I'm watching any other type of motorized racing. Well, I've heard actually, I've heard in Formula E that they're actually building together. They're, they, they've, they're now starting to build like, I, I don't know what it is, what the mechanism exactly it is, but a, a simulator that simulates the sound, right? right? Of the car, yeah. of, of, a, of a, maybe what a Formula One, maybe something closer to a Formula One car. 
Yeah. But even Formula One cars have gotten quieter over time. Like I know, like a lot of people are mad when they when they you know when they went to the turbo era and went and dropped from the you know twenty thousand RPM you know V sixes or V or V tens down down to the you know to the turbocharged six type. To kind of really took the wine out of it and, and took something away. Yeah. If you had a chance uh, to to race a lap um, with any person in history, or, or maybe let's say drive a lap with any person in history. Who who would be sort of in your passenger uh, in your passenger seat? No no family allowed. So person living or dead in your favorite car. So I want to hear person and also favorite car. What would it be? Oh man, well the favorite car would probably be a single seater. <laughs> 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 like uh, if, if we're gonna if we're gonna play lead follow, I would love to go do a lap in say like a 1975 Ferrari Formula One car with Nicky Lauda. Mm-hmm. Maybe if I was like in um, a more modern car, um, like you know, like my Corvette's a really cool race car. I really like it. It's it's fun to drive and fast. Um, Dan Gurney, mm-hmm. as just give me some pointers. Like yep. probably the greatest American racer. Like I met I met him um, just about six months before he passed away. What a really nice guy. Just the best. He was super super nice guy. Amazing, amazing. Um, my hero <laughs> is Dan Gurney's your Dan Gurney's your hero. Yeah, I, uh, really. As far as racing, I think just um, built his own car. The only the only uh, American to win a Formula One race in a car of their own making. Right. Uh, just so talented. Invented the, the Gurney flap, you know, which is used on every race car that exists now. Um, just the guy was amazing. And his company, All American Racing, builds the landing legs for, for SpaceX. What? You, oh, interesting. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't yeah. know that. Um, what you, was that? You're doing? No, no, I didn't. I didn't even know until I found out later. What's what's AAR? Oh, that's All American Racing. That's actually Dan Gurney's shop because they, you know, they build carbon fiber chassis for race cars. So they were the right guys to to build this carbon fiber chassis, basically, which which is a landing leg. <laughs> what, what do you what do you think about the uh, popularity of like racing in, in the in the U.S. because it's certainly skyrocketed in a way, right? And I think well, if you look at I know, a lot of it is due to the you know famous documentary on Netflix. It, everyone talks yeah, about Drive to yeah, Survive. Drive to Survive. It it kind of ruined the race experience for me because like I was at I was at Coda la- last year. I raced my Corvette there in the support races, and it was so crowded there. They had twice as many people. There was four hundred thousand people there that weekend. Yes. And when I was there in twenty nineteen, there were two hundred thousand, so it doubled the number of people there. You couldn't you couldn't go get lunch. You could <laughs> you had to wait forever to, just to get a drink. You, if you, they weren't in the stands, you couldn't even get near a, a monitor to see what's going on. It's it's kind of ruined it uh, from the from a fan experience. I think it's great that it's that I, I think it's great that it's brought more fans to the to the sport, but uh, it's just overloaded the the venues. I mean, but they're adding more now. Now there's three races in the U.S. instead of instead of just one. So it's you know it's it's good do and you, bad. Do you go to the races, F1 races in the in the U.S.? Yeah, I'm actually. I've already signed up to go to Coda to Austin, Texas this year, but it's right about the time of our launch. So I think I'm going to actually bail out of it. Okay. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Um, very cool. Um, all right. Well, last question, Tom. Um, could you give us maybe one of your kind of favorite or most memorable moments from your time at SpaceX that, you know, you, that, that you carry, carry with you close to your heart. It could be funny. It could be, it could be, I don't know, something embarrassing or just something inspirational, whatever, uh, whatever I sticks think- out at you. You know, there's. Uh, we always talk about the the big ones, like going to the space station for first launch. How about one that's just a crazy moment in Texas, like the time we had we had the hose. We were doing the pump testing. We had a fuel pump hose, and it broke. And it, it, there's so much velocity coming out of that pump that it, it would always break the hose. It just so much dynamics that the hose broke and sprayed fuel everywhere. And we had. And, and then when we vented the tank, when we vented the locks tank, there was locks coming out of the vent, spraying onto top of the fuel. And we were out there, you know, we're still leaking out of the hose. We're trying to wrap the, the hose with a rag. And here comes a lightning storm. There's lightning hitting out there. And we're like sitting on liquid oxygen and fuel. It's just crazy. It's just like these these crazy moments that uh, that happened all the time in Texas. Somehow we survived. <laughs> did, did, would you would you ever go to space? I would love to. My my bucket list would be to go to the moon and ride an electric dirt bike on the moon. 
<laughs> you know, you know, you know, it's, 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 it's looking more and more realistic every day. Um, when do you think, uh, sorry, I know I said last question, but I mean, I just thought of a couple more. When do you think, uh, we will be back on the moon? When do you think, uh, like humans on the moon? This decade, this but decade, late, late this decade, yeah. late this decade. And then Mars early, early next decade, early, early thirties. Got it. Amazing. It's going to take, take a while to get a uh, human rating on Starship. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. It was lovely chatting and, and uh, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. It was fun. I can't wait to have you back. We'll, we'll get you back here after, uh, after mission one. Okay. Awesome.